Welcome to Life Happens, where Texans come to protect their legacy and prepare for the second half of life. Join your host, attorney Kim Hegwood with Hegwood Law Group and our weekly guest as we navigate the challenges that emerge as life happens. Now here's your host, Kim Hegwood. Good morning. Welcome to Life Happens with me, Kim Hegwood. Our very special guest today is Ryan McGinnis. Did I say that right? Yes. Perfect, because I'm usually not that good. So and uh, <laughs> just want to make sure we're doing everything right. Uh, you own a company called Minute Women Home Care. I do. So how did the name come about? Because I was dying to ask that. <laughs> so a lot of people ask that, and and obviously people can't tell on the, the interwebs, but I'm, I'm a big, tall, burly guy. So um, my aunt started this company in 1969, and uh, we're located in Lexington, Massachusetts. Lexington is known for the, the Revolutionary War, the Minutemen soldiers. So when she started the company, she said, we're a woman-owned company. We're going to name it Minute Women because everybody's named Minute Man Plumbing around here. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, when when I bought the company from her 10 years ago this month, actually, um, I uh, decided to keep the name because it was such a good icebreaker. Everybody was like, what? Like, why do you own a company named Minute Women? And it allowed people to have a good laugh and um, and just to, to, like I said, break the ice and start to have a conversation about things. So... The one things that we find in um, when we talk to clients about, you know, when you're talking about long term care and you're talking about options and, you know, and you're like, yeah, well, you know, there's always in home care, you know, and there's, you know, a lot of good companies out there, some better than others. And um, but it seems like the cost of care is rising faster than inflation. If you even look at inflation, it's really skyrocketing the, the cost of care. Um, what are you seeing, you know, there in regards to um, the cost, you know, around the country in the sense of, you know, people who need care can't afford it. How do they afford it? You know, that kind of stuff. Because the rising cost affects your business as well. So what are you seeing? Uh, so we're seeing the cost go up dramatically. Um, Massachusetts, where I'm located doing private home care, um, doesn't have a lot of regulations on uh, private agencies, so they treat them as like a house cleaning company. So it's really the onus is on the uh, families to make sure that they're hiring somebody that they think is is good, um, which which um, has its pros and cons certainly. Um, but with when it comes to the costs uh, increasing, you know Massachusetts was was progressive in the sense of of having a fifteen dollar minimum wage, and we're going to get to that minimum wage in in another two years. Um, it's going up seventy. Five cents each year until it hits fifteen dollars an hour, and we were all, you know, people were worried about that and concerned. But the pandemic has completely blown that out of the water. Fifteen dollars an hour, um, you can't even you can't hire somebody at fifteen dollars an hour. And so what we've seen over the last eighteen months is a uh, a number of things. One is that um, caregivers have left the industry because they didn't want to be front facing and working with individuals that may have COVID without knowing it. Uh, the industry as a whole has a lot of movement around it, meaning caregivers work at hospitals, nursing homes, assisted livings, VNAs, hospices, private home care agencies, and they can be going to many different clients each day or each week, which obviously means they're more susceptible to running into COVID. Um, Additionally, what's caused the, the rates to go up, meaning that the caregivers are getting paid more, is that COVID has really put a, a kibosh on immigration. A lot of our caregivers are from um, Africa. We have a lot of Ugandan caregivers, Haitian caregivers. Obviously, that's not Africa. But um, for us, we get a lot of Ugandan caregivers. And so there just hasn't been as much immigration into the United States because of obvious reasons. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of... Uh, I, I'm sick of this phrase, but I'm going to use it. It's kind of a perfect storm of, of you know, nobody wants to be in the industry um, right now. It was already an industry that was was really needing more caregivers before COVID-19. And after that, um, you know, in the middle of this, I guess we're not after COVID-19. In the middle of this, it's really causing the rates to increase dramatically because the caregivers rates are going up quite a bit. Um, additionally, digging down a little bit more into that is that a lot of 
families are calling us up looking for um, short hour cases, anything under six hours blocks of time. And, you know, as much as it, it pains me to say, like, listen, it, you know, if you get six hours of care three times a week, that is going to be very costly. But when you think about it in the whole um, uh, scheme of a week, a week has 168 hours in it. So these caregivers right now know that if they decline a six hour a day case for three times a week for 18 or 25 or 30 hours, they're probably gonna get called from another agency offering them a 12 or 16 hour shift for three or four days in a row because there's such a demand for caregivers right now. So we're also seeing a lot of families who just need a little bit of care and they're not able to get any uh, any agencies like myself and, and myself included to be able to staff it because it's just a recipe for disaster because the caregivers will resign within a few days because they got a call from another agency offering them more hours and lucrative, uh, lucrative jobs. So it's uh, certainly becoming going to be interesting what happens post pandemic and what happens um, over the next 12 to 24 months. Sometimes I think I'm not so sure that, you know, COVID triggers all this. I think this has been an ongoing I think it's been like an ongoing concern for a while as far as because we've got so many more baby boomers that are needing care versus the number of people out there that can provide the care and do it well. You know, so some of my clients have gotten real creative about, you know, what they do. So let's talk about tech for a little bit. You know, even with um, even with my grandparents, one of the first things I bought was a baby monitor um, because my grandmother had slept one place and my grandfather was actually in the bed you know, and, and he was worried, you know, and even when I had him at the house, I took the baby monitor with me. So it was in his room, I could hear him. What other kind of things are you seeing that kind of help families, you know, and even your caregivers, you know, when it comes to technology? So technology is really interesting in the senior care world because seniors as a whole are not going to be interacting with technology. They're uh, less likely to adapt to new technologies than uh, somebody your age or my age or younger, um, I'll probably be that old crusty guy that's like, no, this is how the smartphone was back in 2020. I don't want the new 2060 smartphone. But, um, you know, we, we have to adapt to those situations. And so, you know, what I am seeing more and more is people being focused on technology that seniors don't need to interact with. Um, you know, clearly the Zooms of the world, clearly the FaceTime is a, is a piece of technology that's that's been able to kind of push its way into the senior world because it's so simple to use and it's easy to use and I think the zooms and the Googles are all going down that road of being you know one click and, and it's operating um, but that's been you know COVID has forced that on a lot of seniors that if you want to have interactions if you want to go to a council on aging uh, meeting you're gonna have to do it remotely over zoom and so it has kind of forced people's hands a little bit more than they normally would have been um, one of the technologies that I think is 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 ripe for um, seeing some changes is with uh, the the lifelines. Um, you know, one of the the problems with lifelines is as good of a service as it is, it does have some drawbacks. Is that the caregiver the, the the client needs to use it, they need to wear it, and then secondly, they need to push the pendant when they fall, unless they have an automatic kind of call response. And so when you're you're handling somebody that's either stubborn and doesn't want to use it or has memory issues and they forget to use it, there's that problem. And so what we're seeing um, is, is where technology is coming in and, uh, and solving that problem by having kind of like smoke detector styled sensors on the wall that can detect if somebody's fallen. And then that way, it can automatically text dozens of people at one time that a fall event has occurred without the senior needing to interact with it whatsoever. And so where I think things are going to be heading is that in that direction where how can we help the senior without them having to interact or use the um, the the technology itself because then you have the best of both worlds where somebody's going to be safe in their home, able to age longer in their home while also not depending on them to use the technology that's going to keep them safe. Um, a lot of people still use the, hey, I call mom at nine in the morning and three o'clock in the afternoon to see how things are going. The problem with that is, if God forbid the fall happens at four o'clock at night, 
your 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 toast until 8 30 9 o'clock in the morning when you make that call so i think you know those those companies like well aware care that does the remote monitoring and fall detection with using things using technology that isn't interactive with the uh senior is going to become more and more popular yeah, I could just envision myself having cameras put all over the house. I could watch her while I was working. <laughs> yeah, and that's and that's the thing that's interesting is that their cameras are very polarizing. Either people are open to it or people are really against cameras. Because and when you think about it, where cameras are, they're generally going to be in two places of the home that are are the most intimate: your bedroom and then your bathroom. Um, those where a lot of falls happen, and the kitchen is obviously one of them as well. Um, so where where I think people are going to see is like that well aware care does have cameras but it also uses radar technology as well to determine if somebody's fallen so it allows that kind of privacy to still be had and it doesn't feel as much as big brother is but there might be people like yourself that are like camera me up just to make sure <laughs> i'm good um the thing with the, the the thing with the camera though is that on um, if you just have a camera in the home it's as useful as a telephone because somebody has to be watching the camera to determine that something's happened, right? So you you need a one-two punch. The camera's there watching, and then there's a second action that notifies family members of a fall or an emergency so that you can then open up the camera and say, oh, wow, mom is on the floor. We need to call 911 right now. And that's where technology is going to get real interesting over the next couple of years. Yeah, we find that, you know, COVID really pushed the... Uh, the envelope, so to speak, because, you know, you didn't want to put your loved one in a nursing home because you couldn't see them. You know, you couldn't visit. There were so many, oh my God, we got calls all the time, you know. Um, you know, even, you know, even, you know, my aunt who right at the end, you know, ended up in, in, a, in a nursing home care and no one could see her. They wanted to quarantine her for 14 days. And we're like, she doesn't have 14 days. You know, so um, it really kept a lot of people. Uh, I found that a lot of my clients that, that were working, that had to work from home, put their parents with them, you know, so they were trying to do their jobs and things like that. Did you find that, that, that you know, in your area that more nursing homes were, were not making it through the pandemic because of all the different things that had occurred? Um, I don't know if I don't know how many uh, nursing homes closed through the pandemic. Massachusetts has seen nursing home closures happening at a steady rate, but most of the time they're outside of the Boston area, which is where I'm located. And so if even if one does fail in the Boston area, there's so many close by that they can probably pick up the slack for now, especially now since nobody wants to go into nursing home. Um, you know, my industry in private home care, as well as assisted living, we are the ones quite frankly, that we're, we're the options for people that don't want to put mom into a nursing home or to delay that as long as possible. Uh, COVID-19 exacerb exacerbated, I think I said that right, um, that feeling of I don't want to go into a nursing home and I will not put mom or dad into the nursing home unless it is, you know, a last um, resort uh, situation. Um, the problem with that is, is that, you know, the nursing homes work on a, 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 I don't know how else to say kind of like a communism styled approach where the rich are paying for the poor. The people that have the money go in there, they pay privately and those that don't have money are reimbursed by Medicaid, but then the nursing home gets their profits from the people that are wealthier. And so what's been happening because of industries like my own and assisted livings is that people spend down their money at home or in an assisted living and then show up to a nursing home somewhat hat in hand without a whole lot of money left. And so that means that, you know, Medicaid is not reimbursing nursing homes a whole heck of a lot of money. And so what's been happening with nursing homes pre-pandemic was that they were trying to cut costs as much as possible, which meant that the services they were providing, the food maybe got a little bit worse, the buildings didn't get updated as much. And then all of a sudden, less people wanted to go to a nursing home. So what meant we, then the vicious cycle, the downward spir spiral occurs because they need to save costs, which means that it makes the nursing home less desirable, which means less people want to go to the nursing home, right? So, so pre-pandemic nursing homes were in trouble. And post-pandemic, or while we're in the middle of this, they're in real trouble. Their association is saying that, that and this was six months ago when we thought that COVID was only going to be for a year or so. So who knows what happens in the future? 
they were saying that 1,800 closures or mergers were going to happen throughout the United States with nursing homes. Um, and nursing homes right now are the number one place that uh, people go when they, they have memory care issues, right? So if they're not going to an assisted living or a memory care spe a specific assisted living, they're going to long-term care in a nursing home. And so we are in effect, pulling the rug out of um, a lot of families that don't have a lot of money, but have loved ones that have a 10 year disease. And there's nothing that you can do about this disease right now. There's no way to prevent it and there's no way to stop it. Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. And the reason why I wanted to mention this with you is that, you know, there, there, there is a problem out there, and the more nursing homes that close, we're going to see uh, more people that either don't go into a nursing home, or if a nursing home does close, that might mean they're transferred to a nursing home much further away, that their family members can't visit them nearly as, as much. And so maybe there was a nursing home that was 10 miles away, but now it's 40 miles away, and you know, I can only see mom once a week now instead of three times a week or whatever it ends up being. So there, there's a lot of ramifications. And my concern is that you're going to have, you know, more people on the streets that would have normally been in a nursing home that have dementia. And um, certainly my industry is, is part of that issue, but it's also catering to what customers want, which is what they want to stay in home as long as they humanly can. And if they can pay for that, they will. Um, so it's a concern about nursing homes and how they're going to do um, with this pandemic. And now that it seems like this pandemic is going to last uh, ongoing, at least another winter with the Delta variant, because you're down in the South, um, you're having your indoor season right now, and we're going to have our indoor season in another few months. Um, so we're going to—it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the New England regions and in the, the Rust Belt and in Oregon and in Washington when it gets really cold outside. So, you know, people like in-home care. You know, they—they they like being at home. And um, so, how do you how do you figure or how do you? What do you think that's going to look like as far as the future of, of home care? You know, if the prices are a lot higher, how do we how do we combat the, you know, the increase in pricing per se, but still allow someone to stay at home longer? You know, because people do better at home. You know, that's that, that's a given. The studies are there. The statistics are there. And anybody that's not at home can tell you they do better at home, which is why they send you home from the hospital as fast as they do these days, because you heal better at home. Um, how, what do you think is, is going to be the future as far as, you know, in-home care and care like that? Yeah, I mean, I think right now what we're seeing in terms of affording in-home care is reverse mortgages are becoming very popular. Um, in the New England area and in, in the suburbs around, uh, I shouldn't say the Boston area, in the suburbs around Boston, you have a lot of towns that are now have become very wealthy and people bought a $60,000, $70,000, $100,000 home in the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s that is now worth $1 million or $900,000 or $1.2 million. And they have very little cash in hand outside of Social Security and their 401k or pension, but they've got this huge chunk of change and equity in their home. And they're able to take 60% of that or up to 60% of that and pay for in-home care, or pay for whatever they want. It's their equity and their money. That is becoming very popular. Um, the reason why I mentioned well aware care is because I think that's where technology is going to be taking Taking more of a of a uh, place in our our daily lives where you're going to have cameras or radar or instant communication if something goes wrong because listen you know when somebody falls once in a while that isn't obviously a a uh, a automatic demand for 24 hour care the only way I can prevent a fall is to be in the home 24 hours a day but that's just not that's just not cost it's cost prohibitive for many families so what's the the alternative to you know bubble wrapping somebody what can we allow to what you know what's that comfort level right and then if you have technology that comes into the home that can provide that then you can then use my services and supplement those danger areas for um for a loved one um so i think technology is going to to be uh, big i mean amazon google 
all these large fang type companies are looking at baby boomers and seniors and gen xers and seeing that there's a lot of money to be spent on staying in their home as long as possible and you have to imagine that alexa and google home and all of these devices that allow connectivity you know throughout the country are going to be utilized in some way to keep people safe in their home so that if somebody does fall they can say hey alexa call 911, I've fallen, and then all of a sudden 911 shows up. So, you know, there's definitely going to be options there. But at the end of the day, I don't see there being a, at the risk of sounding like the typewriter salesman, you know, <laughs> you know, saying the computer is not going to uh, overtake my industry. I just don't see there being a huge replacement for hands-on, one-on-one -on -one care. Those robots aren't good enough yet. The, the AI isn't there. And it's not going to be there for another 10 years or 15 years or maybe ever. I don't know. Um, but it's not imminently happening. And so, you know, when somebody does fall, a lot when somebody is incontinent when they need help in the shower no amount of technology right now is going to replace a caregiver being in the home or an assisted living caregiver or a nursing home caregiver so either way you're going to need hands-on care one way or another whether that's from family members or whether you pay for that out of pocket so i know you're involved with the national aging in place council and so yeah. is that something that if someone's looking for in-home care, that that's uh, something that's helpful for you to be part of that? Yeah, I mean, the National Aging in Place Council is something I got involved in a couple of years ago. Um, like, as I mentioned, and uh, I work, I cater with people that have, have wealth, have money, they can pay, you know, $35 an hour for, for home care. And I thought I wanted to give back in some way to, to, to help. And I, I met this uh, a great person, Tara Ballman, who's the executive director of the NAIPC. Um, her heart is in the right place. And the organization, I think, is a, is a really good organization. And it basically is a great group of uh, generally it's senior care providers, but certainly people that are just advocates are more than welcome to join the group as well. But the, the goal of the group is to give back through education and being a resource to the community. Um, in Massachusetts, we, we are fortunate that there's a lot of investment in, um, you know, elder services and in the uh, senior centers and things like that. But there still is an epidemic that's from coast to coast, up to down, left to right, of people that just don't know what their options are when it comes to aging in place or declining mentally or physically. What do we do? What do we talk about? And the idea is, is that we at the National Aging in Place can give back through education, through being a resource, doing talks in person or virtually to let families know what their options are. And then of course, if there's somebody in the NAIPC that can provide that service, we'll certainly introduce them. But the goal of the group is not like a referral-based marketing like a BNI would be. It's more of we're looking for business owners and and um, business professionals that want to help out their community and give back and be part of something really good. There's about 15 or 16 chapters. Um, there's a lot of interest in, in some other areas throughout the country that there are chapters. And I think it's just kind of a good thing to be aware of. And, um, you know, maybe one day you'll be part of the NAIPC yourself. We'll see what happens. Hopefully. And so, all right, Ron, I just want to thank you so much. Um, give us a, a website for your home care? Yeah, my company's uh, mwhomecare.com. That's Minute Women. Um, if you type in Minute Women Home Care, you know, certainly uh, when I do these talks, I, I service 10, 15 miles around Lexington, Mass. The likelihood that I'm going to get business from this is is low. Um, the, the, the goal of my podcast, which is up there right now, the Caregiver's Toolbox, as well as being part of the NAIPC, has always been about giving back and giving education and, and pulling the curtain behind what goes on in the senior care world. And so you can plan with your loved ones on what to do. And I like to say to people that, listen, if you're 50 or 60 years old and your mom or dad is still alive or a family member is still alive and they're aging, you get to kind of peer into the future and see what it's going to look like. And so if you're looking at your 80 year old mom and seeing the difficulty she's having, well, that apple probably isn't falling far from the tree. Now, you know, everybody's different. I understand that. But you can see what the next 20 years might look like. And it's a perfect excuse to sit down and say, hey, what do I want? And where do I go to start looking for that? And then professionals like you, professionals like me can at least point people in the right direction on what to do. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Ryan, for being on the show. And, um, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Kim. 
Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Life Happens with Kim Hegwood. Be sure to tune in every Thursday at 10 a.m. wherever you listen to your podcast as we navigate through the challenges that emerge as life happens. The content of this podcast does not establish an attorney-client relationship or constitute attorney-client privilege, legal, medical, financial, or any other professional advice.